Welcome back to the channel, everybody. So this was a great day. Not a good day. It was a great day. Um, this morning I saw I saw uh, Bitcoin go up. I think it was at 71K. Then once again, I got an alert. It went up again. It just kept going up. Um, I don't know what it's doing right now, but it was looking good last time I saw it. Probably is there was some profit taking and a little bit of a pullback, I'm going to assume. Um, XRP went up as well because of Bitcoin going up. You know how this works. It was the same thing last time. This this always happens. Um, but I saw XRP, I think, at 72 cents. I'm not sure if I got an alert for 73 cents. You guys let me know. Did it hit 73 cents? Um I need to check on that, but it went up. You saw XLM went up. A lot of different things went up, including things that were already up and looking good. Um, so this was a very, very good day. And it actually played out exactly how I was saying in yesterday's video and the day before that, where you're going to get this profit taking. There's going to be a lot of profit taking. Then I say that way more than in the previous bull run, because like I said, the people need the money. So you're going to see this rapid rapid profit taking and then it'll drag prices down a little bit but then like a day or two later it seems like it doesn't take that long right now boom things are going right back up so i'm just right now i'm, I'm just processing the patterns i'm trying to keep in mind the patterns um of how this is working and it doesn't take that long it seems a day or two and the prices go pop back up and bitcoin just keeps going higher and higher but this is what we expected. This is what I've been talking about. Um, I do see Bitcoin at this point. I think easily, easily Bitcoin can probably and this is not financial advice, of course. Right. But um, I think Bitcoin could easily hit 80, 80,000 now easily. Um, and this is all happening before the halving. You know, keep that in mind. And, and if things go how all of these so-called experts say, and after the halving, everything just goes completely nuclear. This is what they say. There's no guarantees in anything. I know that. Then, man, the entirety of the crypto sphere is looking at a really, really good time period. But, you know, we'll wait and see how it all plays out. You know, I, I try to keep a balanced mind. I know things can, can go this way, but I know they also can go that way. Right. So now we have this article here. We have some news today. We have some XRP articles today. We have some Bitcoin articles, Cardano articles, Chainlink articles. All right. So let's begin here. Now, this article is titled Passive Income with XRP. Ripple CTO provides clarity. Um, so let's find out what's going on with this. I thought it was pretty simple how automated market makers work. I mean, are they different on the XRPL than other AMMs? This is not the first time a lot of people are dealing with AMMs, but I suppose there's a lot of newcomers. I don't know. Let's find out what they're talking about here. It says David Schwartz, Ripple CTO, recently clarified the prospect of generating passive income with XRP and the upcoming XRPL ledger automated market maker. Schwartz's comments came in response to a disclaimer presented by a prominent XRPL DUNL validator vet. Notably, there have been reports of numerous benefits that the upcoming AMM could bring to the XRPL community, including the opportunity to earn passive income. Yep, that's what everyone's talking about. Well, they've been talking about. It says important disclaimer. As the automated market maker amendment secures the minimum validator consensus threshold again, VET deemed it necessary to comment on this prospect. According to him, the upcoming AMM would not provide passive income for XRP investors just for, quote, holding, unquote, their tokens. OK, we got to provide a little bit more clarity on that. I wouldn't think that just because you're holding XRP, you would get anything. But do you mean that in correlation with providing you have to provide your XRP and then you get what validator tokens? I'm, I'm, I think that's the way that it typically works. You provide your XRP or in some sort of way they provide you with these so validator validator tokens, and then you earn yield off of those tokens. I think that's how it is. I but don't quote me on that, but I believe that's how it works. But let's find out here because, uh, you know, David Schwartz is going to provide clarity. It says he emphasized that investors would need to provide liquidity by handing out their XRP tokens to any AMM instance. That's what I was saying. Yeah. So, I mean, like maybe some people don't know that, but I thought that was pretty well known. It says these XRP tokens would be available as liquidity for market participants looking to trade on the automated market maker, notably VET's disclosure aimed to debunk claims that XRP investors could secure passive income by holding their XRP tokens instead of depositing them in the liquidity pools. Yeah, but why would people think that? Once again, like you heard what I just said, I think that's pretty well known. I, 
all the articles I've ever read made that very, very clear. Um, but maybe, maybe uh, some sources are not making that clear. Yes, you have to provide your XRP tokens. That's just how automated market makers that I've seen work across the board. Um, so let's see what, uh, let's hear what David Schwartz has to say. The Ripple CTO chimed in, clarifying that while investors could earn passive income from simply providing liquidity, see how you put that in there? That's important. It says the mechanics involved with automated market makers passive income opportunity are not the same as what market participants witness with traditional staking. Yes, but I don't I don't know why people would think otherwise. And once again, I don't know where the lack of where the misunderstanding is coming in. At least people on this channel should know how automated market makers work. We went over that extensively. We know about providing your tokens for liquidity, validator tokens, if that's going to be something that this AMM employs, which most of them, I believe, do. Um, yeah, so I think we know we, we're, we're pretty privy and abreast to how this works. This is according to Schwartz. When it comes to passive income generation, different mechanisms come into play and they operate in different ways. In this case, XRP. In the case of XRP, if you want to generate passive income using AMM system, you would need to trade your XRP for claims against the AMM pools. While you can reclaim XRP on demand, yeah, that so that's another thing. So when you're done, get your XRP back. While you can reclaim XRP on demand, the amount that you get back may not necessarily be the same as what you put in. In other words, this process involves a level of risk. Yes, but everything is risky. I don't think a lot of people are worried about that, honestly. So many people are taking a huge amount of risk in a lot of things, even, uh, let's say, certain very risky meme coins, which, you know. Um, so, listen, people are adults. They can make up their own minds about what they want to participate in. Um, they do, they do, they don't, they don't. Everyone has to make their own choices. That's how I look at it. But anyway, but there's risk everywhere. You want to be honest. It's risky how just being involved with banks right now. That's a heck of a risk. Did you see all the, the cadre of articles that came out the last two days showing a visual? If you type in on Google visual um, map of banks, commercial real estate exposure. Yeah, that's starting to become a very hot topic because they're in big trouble. So everything is risky. <laughs> Getting that di direct deposit into the bank is risky. <laughs> It's just business banks, but I have a good laugh at your expense. Anyway, <laughs> it says the AMM operates under a different mechanic than staking. So it's important to understand the differences between the two if you're considering generating passive income from XRP. All right. So listen, like I said, I thought that was pretty clear in my humble opinion, but maybe some people were not clear on that. So now let's move on here. We have a lot of news to get through today. Um, very, very good stuff. And people are even more bullish on Bitcoin now, or those who were trying to be sort of conservative with uh, certain estimates. Now we're getting, you know, they're seeing proof that Bitcoin can go absolutely astronomical uh, nuclear. And so now we're getting more people coming out with uh, their predictions and such reputable, sort of reputable people. So this article is titled, Bernstein is now more convinced that Bitcoin will hit one hundred and fifty thousand dollars after after a massive rally. Um, yes, I could see Bitcoin doing that. Yes. You know, I'm going to stick with 80K to 85K and then 100K. Right. Um, and with pretty good volatility there. But I would not be surprised at all at this point. Um, Bitcoin is capable of anything at this point, in my humble opinion. So one hundred and fifty K price target. I think that's respectable, in my humble opinion. It says here, Bernstein analyst said on Monday that they were now more convinced about Bitcoin hitting 150K by mid-2025. By mid-2025? Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess that's, that's actually really reasonable. Um, I think if things go well, continue to go well this year, I think we see an 85K Bitcoin. I think so. I think we could do it. What do you think? You think we could see that? And if Bitcoin is at $85,000, XRP is going to be up. Everything's going to be up. Ethereum will be up. Everything will be up much higher. It'll be a beautiful time. So never forget how Bitcoin affects everything. So sure, 
We want Bitcoin to win because we hold some Bitcoin as, as well. We want to make that continue to make that good money off of Bitcoin. But at the same time, everything else is greatly affected and it raises them up as well. And, you know, we'll, we'll see a little nice price action off of them, possibly. Right. It says. Uh, so anyway. The analysts also predicted that Bitcoin will break out after the next halving event. See, they keep saying that. So and so it's very interesting. We'll see how that works. It's very interesting how that's that that might work with Bitcoin just absolutely taking off right now. So what does it do after the halving? It says reiterating its bullish call in some of the miners despite fa uh, falling share prices. The broker repeated its $150,000 price target for the world's largest cryptocurrency, citing booming exchange traded fund inflows and said investors should buy Bitcoin mining stocks to gain exposure to the coming rally. All right. So that's their opinion. Um, let's move on here. We have another Bitcoin article. Things are looking very, very good in the crypto sphere. Hopefully everybody is doing well in life as well out there. I hope you're all doing well. I appreciate every single one of you. You should already know that. And I mean it, too. Like, I really genuinely mean it. I appreciate every single one of you uh, watching. So may all the all, all good things come to you and yours. So this article here is titled Black Rock Filings Can Send Bitcoin Far Higher Than One Hundred and Thirty Eight Thousand Dollars. Analyst says BlackRock plans for a pair of multi-billion dollar funds to add Bitcoin exposure through its spot Bitcoin ETF and other products. It says BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, now plans to purchase spot Bitcoin ETF or ETPs, my apologies, ETPs for its $18 billion global allocation fund and $36.7 billion strategic income opportunities fund. Things are getting insane. Um, how does all of this affect Bitcoin into the future? You know, it says Reflecting on this news and larger adoption of Bitcoin products into the world's largest financial funds, crypto analyst Scott Melker projected that Bitcoin price will soon reach more than double its all time high. Its all time high mark. Sorry about that. A little like ad popped up right in the middle of the article. It says, quote, but imagine. When it's not active investing, but it's completely passive, unquote, Melker said in the video above, quote, imagine when the Fidelities and BlackRocks and Merrill's and anybody else who's indexing adds these products and has to continue to add them to keep up with the percentage of the AUM of that fund. This could send Bitcoin far higher than one hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And yes, and listen, no doubt in my mind, they want it to go there 100 percent, whether it will actually go there. Who's to know? Um, but it's all a part of their takeover as well. They're getting theirs. You see, I think this is happening. I said this before, but let me reiterate. I think this is happening with a lot of these cryptos. You see the pressure on retail. They continue to FUD retail and they use social media against retail because they know a lot of people, uh, retail people, they like to hang out on social media. So they blitz them with FUD. They blitz them with uh, negative energies. And then those people are more apt to sell. They just a psychological warfare. That's how I look at it. And I could be completely wrong, folks, but they attack them with psychological warfare. And while they're selling, you hear about record amounts being purchased by the big companies, record amounts being purchased by whales. And this is happening with a lot of cryptos, the top cryptos. A lot of the top cryptos continue to see a lot of retail selling, but then a lot of big purchasing from whales and uh, uh, companies. There's a reason for that. So I think that they're looking at it like it's our turn to play. We're going to take over. We're going to make all this capital. Sure, retail, we get to play a little bit, but they're looking at retail more as um, people they can just take money from to keep it very simple. Right. We're just going to take your money. Um, I mean, once they control a large amount of all of these top cryptos, they just sell it however they want. Right. And you have to pay if you want it. You got to pay. Um, so. There there's that. So I believe they're taking this very serious and they do want Bitcoin at a much, much higher price. It says here and it will look good on them that they got in at the right time. They took over at the right time and that the people who are participating in these ETFs and ETPs are able to benefit greatly from it. Then they definitely want that. Um, so it will look good on BlackRock and Valkyrie and and uh, all the others. Right. It says, quote, 
This means they would be passively investing in their Bitcoin spot ETF and adding it to funds as small as a small allocation, quote Melker explained. Quote, let's say it's 1%, 2%, 3%, and even 5% of those funds. As we see more retail get access to spot ETFs because they are finally approved to trade them, as we see more RIA platforms come on online, we know that that's going to continue to add demand and buying pressure. All right. So, and you see what, what Bitcoin did today. Uh, it was looking really good. So now. Let's move on here to this article. This article here is titled, if it will pop up, <laughs> we'll see if it pops up. You know, a lot of these websites have so much stuff they're trying to load up. They're trying, they, got, they have ads on the side they're trying to load up. Um, they have a picture, which to me, the pictures are not really necessary. I don't even know why they add the pictures. It's not like a thumbnail on YouTube. They have videos they're trying to load. And so, you know, it causes a bit of lag when you have like a billion um <laughs> tabs open because you got all this research up on, on the computer, you know? Anyway, so I was just talking about this, the massive accumulation of, of these different cryptos. So you have massive accumulation of Bitcoin, massive, uh, according to Sa Santiment and all and uh, Whale Alert and all these other places, massive accumulation of XRP. And now we're hearing about accumulation of Chainlink. And did we cover an article, I think recently about Whales accumulating Solana, I believe. I believe it was Solana, but now they're talking about Chainlink. So this article here is titled New Whales Begin Accumulating Massive Amounts of Chainlink. Yeah, things are starting to take off. People are getting in position. This is still, I think a lot of individuals are looking at this as still being early. I do also look at it, look at it as being early, although I feel like I'm, I'm well enough positioned with certain things. There's probably one thing and I'm not going to mention what it is, but there's one thing where I would love to get a little bit more. I'll say that. I'll just leave it at that. Get a little bit more. Just one thing. Um, but everything else, especially like chain link and all the big dogs. Yeah, I feel like I'm well positioned. But these other entities where prices are at now are nothing for them. They're like, this is where we want to get in right now. We've seen enough proof. They were waiting on the proof, like they said, with the. Uh, that other prediction that they saw enough proof to say Bitcoin is going here. Well, some people feel like that, like they've seen enough proof to get in now. The bull run is is cemented. Um, so they're I feel like they're piling up. So it says this new deep pocketed entities have accumulated the native asset of the decentralized Oracle provider Chainlink, according to blockchain trading firm Look on Chain. Look on Chain says that eight different addresses withdrew 16.7 uh, seven, uh, sixteen point seven two million dollars worth of link tokens from Binance, the world's largest crypto exchange. It says, "quote It seems that whales are buying link. We noticed that eight fresh wallets withdrew eight hundred and thirty one thousand one hundred and sixty link from Binance in two days." And then they give you the address as well. They're thorough. Good job, Daily Hoddle. It says over the last several months, Look On Chain has tracked quote unquote, mysterious whales, likely institutions accumulating link. Like I said, see that the institutional takeover is here. It's just beginning. It's just beginning. And they're going to accumulate. They're going to drive the prices of a lot of stuff up and things that people once could acquire at a low price. I, I don't think it's far fetched to believe that in the future they will not be purchased cheap. They just won't. The, 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 the institutions are here. Prices are going to go up. And once people uh, take their profit and such, I think you're going to see much higher lows. Is that how they say it, right? Higher lows. So anyway, it says at the time of writing, Link is trading at $21.29. Yeah, we're looking great right now, in my humble opinion. Up nearly 7% in the last 24 hours. We're up majorly from where Link was months ago. I'll tell you that much. Look on chain has also has his eye, also has his eye on Dogecoin and Flocky. Dogecoin rival Flocky. Okay. All right. I don't need to cover that. Um, <laughs> so let's go here. <laughs> let's go here. Um, we have some Cardano news. So big news for Cardano. I love to hear good things about Cardano. Uh, this article is titled Cardano's real world adoption. The UAE United Arab Emirates embraces the blockchain. That is major. 
good way to make a splash. So let's find out what the heck they're doing over here. It says the United Arab Emirates, one of the richest countries in the world, has embraced Cardano to secure its criminal investigations. In a recent update shared by Chris O, the founder of the Cardano Ghost Fund DAO, UAE's decision to adopt Cardano represents the blockchain's, quote, massive real world adoption. And no doubt in my mind, and I could be wrong, folks, but this is just where they're starting. They will probably expand the use of Cardano greatly into the future, but they're going to test it out in this way first. You know, if they're happy with the product, then they expand later. That's typically how it goes. It says at the World Police uh, Summit in Dubai, the Dubai police submitted a Cardano based pilot project holding data management capabilities. The project analyzed the secure sharing of sensitive data related to criminal investigations with authorities such as Interpol. The presentation of the Cardano integrated project highlighted the high level of security involved in share in the sharing and sharing the scans of bullets and concrete obtained through an advanced scanner using blockchain significant forensic information was distributed safely among international stakeholders worldwide. Hold on, give me one moment here. It says, according to Chris Post, Cardano's data management and its capability to share data without being tampered with makes it the ultimate choice of the Dubai police. Chris wrote on X it says the blockchain ensures that data is not tampered with and can be tracked among various stakeholders. This is an ideal use case for blockchain and Cardano. So, hey, listen, that is great for Cardano. Great news. I wonder how much this is going to be reported on and if, if it makes people a little bit more bullish on Cardano. But once again, Cardano has a strong, strong community uh, and it's a money maker also. That's what I've experienced. I've, I've experienced Cardano being a moneymaker multiple times in bull runs. It, and when it takes off, it takes off very quickly. But that's just my that's just my experience. All right. So now let's move on here. We're going to close out with this article. Once again, I hope you're all having a fantastic day. Hope you're all doing well. I hope your health is well. I hope your, your physical health is great. I hope your, your mental health is great. You know, stay positive. Bathe your mind in positivity. Um, we all know there's negatives we have to deal with, but you don't have to bathe yourself in negativity. Um, you don't need to feed poison into your mind, you know, visualize, visualize good things, do things that make you feel good and bring balance to your own life, right? You can't wait for life to bring that balance. You got to bring balance to life, right? That's how I look at it. Just my humble opinion. So now, oh, I actually have one of these articles about visualizing. So anyway, this article is titled Visualizing Major U.S. Banks by Commercial Real Estate Exposure. And now that I'm reading the title, I remember why I have this um, this article up. This actually was an eye opener for me, an eye opener for me. Listen to this, folks. The commercial real estate exposure of the largest U.S. banks. And I didn't know some of these banks were as deep as they're in. They are in trouble. Big, big trouble. Be careful out there, folks. If this if because there's no guarantees, if this all goes down and some of them are hit hard and there's bank runs, bank runs happening, because believe you me, the regular people don't know about this. So it'll be the last. You know how this goes. It'll be the last second. Something happens with these banks because of this. Then the major mainstream media will start just blasting the news because they have to cover it because it's hot news and that because of the way that they do it hitting everybody all at once at the last second it causes panic in the people and that's when bank runs start but if any of these banks get in trouble here's the big question that people need to ask do they initiate bail-ins that whole bail-in thing is is, a, is tremendously bad but anyway i'm just going to read the percentage that some of these have it says the uh, let's let me read this piece total loans by bank proportion of cre loans and of course, CRE is commercial real estate, the guillotine of banks. So First Citizens Bank, 14.9%. Citigroup, 4%, which is, let's put that into perspective. That's $37 billion, $37 billion. Citizens Bank, 23.1%, $31 billion. And this was a shocker to me. Bank of America, at 6.9%, $76 billion. Wells, Far Wells Fargo, you are in trouble. Wells Fargo is in trouble, folks. 
billion. I'm keeping my eye on Wells Fargo. I mean, I don't have any business dealings with them, but holy smokes. JP Morgan, 12.6% with $171 billion. And it just goes on and on and on. These, they're in trouble. BNY Mellon is on here. Regions is on here. Northern Trust is on here. Capital One with 15.6% with $49 billion. It just goes on and on, folks. We'll see how this, this year shakes out. Right now, as of right now, the banks are in trouble. And um, unless they do something to change my mind or change the data, really not change my mind, but that's how I'm going to feel until they do, until some data comes out and says otherwise. So now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with it. So until next time, everybody, let's get to the money.